Thank you. A very warm welcome to our webinar, The, Her the Year Ahead 2021 Grow Through Change. Uh, we have to change a lot after this COVID-9 pandemic. The first episode of, of this series is the customer of the future, the inner city, the hybrid retail. I think a very timely discussion who was starting already before the COVID-19 crisis, but now I think it's, it's very acute and now perhaps also a chance for the retailers to realize that the future is coming now and it's not the future in 10 or 20 years. And I have to welcome our chair today, Alex Agius Saliba, member of the European Parliament, member of IMCO, Ample AIDA, and chair of the ESME Connect Platform Economy Working Group. Thank you very much that you are so kind to host us. You are a strong supporter for SMEs, and I think what is your strong side is always to connect the legislative side always with the practical side. I think if you have as a politician a touch to the ground, you know what to have, you have to do and how to support. Uh, today we have also two keynote speakers, or one keynote speaker and one case study. We have to welcome Neil Sanders, Managing Director and Retail Analyst from Global Data. I think he gives us the trends and uh, what's now going on here with the retailers in these times. And we have also an SME here. I think it's very important that we have SMEs also in our bubble in Brussels, even if we're now here now online digital, uh, it's always very good to hear SMEs and what are their experience and their needs and what they're expecting for the, from the future and also from the politicians. Then we have, we're going in a debate and uh, the first uh, speaker will be Andreas Haderlein, founder and creator of Local Commerce Alliance Network, consultant and author of research in retail marketing and digital transformation. Thank you very much that you are here today and to do share your experience. You have also active um, uh, experience with projects you initiated in, in Germany. Then we have James Gallacher, CTO Cybertil. I think you give us the, the practical side, how to support with software, with knowledge, SMEs. And we have uh, as a guest also Alexis Vorafka, Head Digital and Competitiveness Independent Retail Europe. Thank you that you are here today. And uh, you are a very well-known organization since I think founded 1967. So you have a history to tell and also how you want to create future. And then Christoph Meinecke, mayor of Wenigstens, Deister, Germany, member of the Presidium of the Innovators Club of the German Association of Cities and Municipalities, winner of the Digital Minds of Germany Award. I think you are well known here in Germany. Now you will become also well known in Europe. And we start now with the opening and conclude uh, with the opening of Alex Agius Saliba. The floor is yours, please. So first of all, thanks host and thanks SME also connect for this very timely discussion that we will be having today. Host has made a very important remark in his uh, initial initial uh, notes. He said that COVID has changed the world as we know it. And I think that this is a starting point of the discussion that we should have today. The world has fundamentally changed with COVID and these changes will continue even post COVID. The shutdown of many EU countries demonstrated first of all, the importance and the reliance that we should have and we must have on sophisticated digital infrastructure to keep our countries, to keep our economies going at least at a basic level in the beginning of the pandemic. The pandemic has basically accelerated, accelerated this rapid digital transitions in all sectors of our society. This transition was there during the past years, but definitely with the COVID, which hit us um, from day to day, ultimately we, have, we had to adapt ourselves and we had to rely more on the digital ecosystem. And the digital economy, has basically supported both our private lives. It has helped us to communicate with our loved ones. Uh, it has helped us to uh, make our purchases and shopping online, share information, but it has also helped us basically to continue to work. It has saved countless amount of jobs, such as with the use of teleworking. It has helped when it comes to learning with remote learning and remote education. 
it has helped us to access culture digitally and also to leisure ourselves and also to network. The digital society has proven to be a vital component of this crisis prone society, but crisis prone economy. Without these existing digital solutions, the crisis would have had a much worse impact uh, on our lives, on our economies. And digitalization has brought therefore real benefits. It has brought real benefits both for the consumers, because it helped them to live as normally as possible during the pandemic, but it has also helped our business by giving them and by giving consumers access to their products and services and also facilitating more transactions uh, between, between these two parties. Consumers and business have embraced totally this digital economy surge, and they are trying to make the best out of it. And I think this is the scope of today's um, discussion, that of helping our industries, helping our startups, um, our SMEs, basically to be able to thrive in this digital ecosystem. But at the same time, this has also brought a number of challenges uh, and also exposed some pre-existing vulnerabilities that we already had in this legal in this legal framework unfair misleading fraudulent commercial practices online which are not a new thing that happened for the first time during the pandemic it has been there for a number of years but became more prevalent prominent during the pandemic because of the vulnerability of our consumers These included, for example, financial scams, false claims, for example, that um, particular products were able to treat or prevent coronavirus, price gushing of essential goods that were daily needed by, by our consumers, and also the promotion of unsafe and counterfeited products, which always is very bad. Uh, when it comes to competitivity and when it comes to good um, business in our in our in our community smaller retailers and also smaller local shops can have a very tough time to compete with big tech giants for example like amazon statistics show that uh, the, those who thrived the most uh, during the pandemic were those were these big tech giants who continued uh, to be more competitive and continue to increase their competitive edge on smaller players in the ecosystem. Amazon's powers have increased over the last several years and it has made it incredibly difficult for smaller players, for smaller companies to match Amazon's, for example, two-day prime shopping and competitive shipping rates uh, on the regular orders. Furthermore, COVID has also appended the global consumer landscape. It has changed consumer behavior. Consumers shifted more online. And they shifted online not only during the pandemic. Um, a lot of consumers have tried and tested for the first time e-commerce. And definitely, I think that the positive side of e-commerce will uh, also continue to guide our consumers to go more online. Therefore, we have to be prepared as SMEs, uh, as industries for these for these changes, for these changes in demand uh, and also for the exasperation of behavioral biases. The way that consumers order, that make their purchases, that they receive their goods and services has changed and will definitely continue to change even post-pandemic. And the role of the physical retailer has been basically called into question. Let's put it like that as shoppers find inspiration and convenience in online retail. The transition could be very challenging, to say the least, for small and local business and these our traditional um, corner shops, fighting a market in which people are already buying less and demanding more convenient ways to shop. With the vaccination now picking up in many countries, businesses that have basically survived the restrictions, the closures that we were facing, are really looking forward to start 
safely reopening and going back in their business as usual um, cycles. However, I personally do not think that we are going back and instead we need to learn from the past year and therefore adapt ourselves for these changes. And I am glad that we are here today to discuss exactly this, this new shift that will bring to our retail industries and basically how this digital effect, this digital revolution that happened and continued to exasperate itself during the pandemic um, will create new business models, new hybrid business models. The debate is very timely, as I said, and I am really looking forward for this discussion that we have today with a number of stakeholders that are working directly um, in this field. And um, I know that, that there will be many questions, but I think that the key one is this. Will my business survive this change? And will things ever go back as they were? And how do I need to adapt myself to thrive also uh, in this digital ecosystem. Again, thanks SME Connect for this invite and I am really looking forward for this discussion. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, I think you gave us a broad overview about consumer rights, consumer protection, but also consumer needs, what consumer wants, the digital involvement, uh, the problematic of competition, that it's fair. And in the end, the key question, it's about surviving of the SMEs because it's in, in the end a business. And what it means, in fact, we discuss also for the inner cities because if they are away, we have empty uh, inner cities but I think the problematic is also deeper because I think we will see this in the discussion. And now we are going now to our for the keynote. I think it's a very good basic for our discussion. It's about a study presented by Neil Saunders. And uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so you can see uh, the slides that we've prepared. And um, what I'm talking about today really is multi-channel retail and having a look at how that changed in Germany and to a certain extent um, across the world during the pandemic, because obviously there were some very big consumer changes, as we know. Now, the first thing to say is why multi-channel? Why do we look at multi-channel in particular rather than looking at online retail? And I think there's a very good reason for that, because when a lot of people talk about retail these days, they talk very much around the point of transaction, so where you make the purchase, which is why you hear a lot of things around, oh, online has grown very dramatically during the pandemic, or stores haven't done quite so well. And there is truth in those narratives when you're just assessing things from the point of view of where the transaction is made. The problem with that, though, and that type of analysis or that type of way of looking at retail is that it's not entirely accurate because the point of transaction doesn't exist in isolation. People don't just suddenly wake up one day and say, right, I'm going to buy that. There's a whole range of things people do to get to the point of actually making a transaction. So what we try to do in all of our analysis is look at the whole purchase journey of the consumer. So to come into the point of transaction, it isn't just about the transaction itself. There's what purchases, uh, what triggers the purchase motivation. There's also browsing and general research. And if you think of something like furniture, for example, if people are buying that bigger ticket item, they often do a lot of research before they end up buying. Even if it's an item of clothing, people may browse to see what's out there first before making a purchase. There's also a lot of planning and detailed research goes into buying some things. If you're buying a new laptop or electronics, for example, you probably will do quite a lot of research onto the specifications, the price point, the kind of things that you want to see within the device that you're buying. So consumers do a lot of these things before they even get to the point of transaction. And then of course, when you've made the transaction, you've bought the product, if you bought it online, you have to receive it. 
And as we know, there are lots of ways of receiving products now. It isn't just about them being sent out to people's homes. You can receive them from stores. You can have them shipped from stores to your homes. There's a whole slew of different methods of collecting products. So that comes into the journey as well. And then finally, we have the aftercare or after service. If you have a follow up, a query, you want to make a return or something like that. So we look at this whole shopping journey because it's a much more insightful way of understanding how consumers are using channels. And what we most often find is that consumers don't use channels in isolation. They use stores and online, sometimes mail order, all of these different channels they use as part of that single purchase journey. And what's very interesting is we had a look uh, over the holiday period, which we define as November and December, um, at um, shopping in Germany. And this is here shows you a number of different multi-channel aspects and the percentage of sales, of online sales, that these things supported over the holiday period. First of all, in 2019, so last, you know, a couple of years ago before the pandemic had had even started and then in 2020 when obviously we, we had the pandemic and what's really interesting is you can see across all of these different metrics the proportion of sales online sales that were supported by physical stores in some way actually rose now that's really counterintuitive because you would think that they would shrink with all the disruption for uh, physical stores and you'd also think that because online surged that maybe stores are becoming less relevant but actually the data um, that we've gathered over this period shows that that isn't actually the case stores are actually playing a much much bigger role now in supporting online sales as part of that multi-channel journey than they used to so if we just dive into some of these things for example customer orders online but collects from the store 18 percent of online sales in Germany were supported in that way in 2019 over the holidays. In 2020, it was 27 percent. And in value terms, that's over 100 percent growth because a lot of retailers in Germany and across the world added in so many more services to allow customers to collect products from store, whether it be driving up to the store, whether it be actually going into the store in a collection point. They offered those click and collect services. And consumers really like those because they're super convenient. We also looked at a retailer shipping the product from a physical store to the customer. So it's where customer orders online, they want the product shipped, but the retailer actually uses the physical store. Now this is a little bit lower in proportionate terms, but again, you can see it went up from 2019 to 2020 because a lot of retailers saw a big uplift in online demand and what they wanted to do was to use their stores to support that because they couldn't really just fulfill through all of the fulfillment centers because of some of the volumes. And then we've also had a look at the shopper using the stores as part of the purchase process. So if you remember our multi-channel journey, this is where people perhaps look in the store first, they go and look around, they do a bit of research in the store. This was the only connection point that actually fell in proportionate terms, although it actually grew in value terms because the growth of online was so big. And the reason it fell in proportionate terms from about 16, 17% to 14% of online sales was simply because stores were closed or disrupted across that period in 2020 because of the pandemic. But of course, as they start to open now, as we move into 2021, this number should pick back up. Now there's a bit of deduplication because some people do more than one thing on the purchase journey, but when you deduplicate these numbers, what you find in total is that in 2019, across the holiday period in Germany, uh, stores supported 32% of retail sales that were made online. In 2020, it was 36%. So actually stores are now playing a much bigger role than they did even before the pandemic. Now, of course, retail was always multi-channel. Stores always played a part uh, in the uh, delivery of online orders and supporting online sales. But the pandemic has actually accelerated that. It's not decelerated it, which is a really interesting finding that has important implications for for policy and for retailers. The other thing I think that's really important is you sometimes hear these narratives around stores are doomed, people won't use stores like they used to because of the pandemic and we've all changed. And we kind of know that that's not true in the sense of 
multi-channel, but it's also true from another perspective because we asked German consumers uh, who had not really visited stores like they did before during the pandemic because of the disruption, what they missed about phys physical stores. And you can see really high numbers of consumers, almost 70% said they missed the social interaction of physical stores. It's very similar number, almost 70% said they missed finding new ideas and new products in stores. 65% missed having that morning or afternoon or a day out, going to retail, looking around the shops, especially things like department stores. 60%, 61% almost missed being able to ask the advice of people in person. And about 53% missed being able to see products. So again, what this shows is the reason stores are not necessarily doomed to failure is because they actually play a really important role in the lives of consumers. And sure, they were disrupted during the pandemic because people couldn't get out and shop like they used to, but it doesn't mean to say people didn't miss going to those shops and that those shops don't have some really important roles to play within the omni-channel journey, aside from just being used to fulfill and support online orders. And I think this shows that very clearly. So there's something really positive there for retailers to build on. The other thing I'd also draw your attention to is I think one of the reasons why multi-channel is so important and why stores have a really key role to play in supporting online sales and being part of that overall journey isn't just because it's what consumers want and what's convenient, it's also because it actually benefits the retailer. These are just some um, margins of, of products. And we've just looked at two here, grocery products and apparel, so clothing products. And you can see if you purchase these things in store, the average grocery margin, as we know, is quite slim. It's around 3.6%. Apparel is around 36, 37%. It's much better. Watch what happens as those um, products are ordered online and they're delivered to someone's home the margins come right down. Online grocery actually isn't for most retailers particularly profitable, if profitable at all, because the last mile delivery is very expensive and the consumer doesn't pay the full price for that. Apparel still is profitable, but the margins come right down because it is again expensive to fulfill and you have a lot of return costs as well if you're just offering, operating that online uh, order delivered to home. However, if you look at the model of purchasing online, but the consumer comes to a physical store to collect it, those margins aren't quite as good as they are purchasing in store, but they are a lot better from delivery to home. So grocery turns positive again, and you see a nice little uplift on clothing as well. So there's something here that tells you why retailers and traditional retailers are really interested in that multi-channel model, because not only is it good from the consumer perspective and helping them drive their sales and support the consumer journey, it actually benefits them financially as well. And I think there's something very, very positive there for traditional retailers as they look to do more in digital, but they look to connect it in an omni-channel way or a multi-channel way to really drive convenience for the customer and drive efficiency within their operation. So just a very quick conclusion from that snapshot of what we had a look at. Retail has always been very interconnected, but it's more interconnected now in a multi-channel sense than it's ever been. And stores and online both play vital roles for the customer and the customer wants to use both. It isn't an either or decision for most customers. It's about using both most effectively. Multi-channel also plays a vital role for retailers. It supported them to support online demand during the pandemic. It helps them to support margins. It helps them operationally. So multi-channel is very, very important for individual retailers. And retailers are investing in their stores and using multi-channel. So even though we've had disruption because of the pandemic, it doesn't mean to say retailers have stopped investing in their stores. They haven't. They're looking at how they can change those stores to be more relevant to consumers. But stores do need to change and adapt. The pandemic has changed the way in which we shop. Multi-channel itself changes how you configure stores. So, of course, stores need to evolve, but that's not new. They've always had to evolve. They've had to evolve over the past decade. They've had to evolve over the past century. Shops nowadays are very different to 50 years ago, and in 50 years' time, they will still be different again. But they're still extremely relevant and important. So to my mind, what COVID has done for retail is it's actually accelerated and disrupted retail. There's no doubt about that. And we've all seen that. And it's created a lot of challenges. But 
it actually hasn't made stores less relevant. And I think that's something that's really important because there is a very negative narrative that goes around about stores being doomed and everything will be online. But actually when you dig into the data, the evidence really doesn't show that. And there's actually a very, very positive future for stores, which I think is really exciting for retail. It's really exciting for our town and our city centers. And it gives us something that we can really build on and take forward with optimism as we look to come out of this very miserable and difficult pandemic and to rebuild our societies and to rebuild retail as well. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. I think you gave us really a, a good overview, a compromised overview. And I want to say only I've, if I give the, 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 the quintessence of this, this study, um, the inner cities are not dead, they are changing. And uh, what, uh, what is also for me important to, to shop analog is this social, creative and active part. So it can be not replaced by, by e-commerce or digital channels, but it, it's additional. And we coming then exactly to a case study because Mr. Samuel Goss has is uh, founder and CEO of My Jolie Candle. And you are really in Instagram, really active. You have over 400,000 followers. And I have to say, this is amazing. And uh, it shows how you can be, how you, you have the success story, how you learned to use these channels for your, your product. So like this, please, the floor is yours. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, yes, we do have 400,000 followers and above, and yet our growth comes uh, mostly from uh, retail. Um, that being said, I'm Sam, I'm 33 years old, and I've been an entrepreneur for 10 years now. Uh, in this amount of time, I founded three businesses, all in the candle industry, but all of them sold candles in, on different channels. Uh, as of today, I'm here as the CEO of My Jolly Candle, what we do very simply is we're a brand of scented candles. Uh, we're based in France and we, uh, as you said, initially started online only. Uh, for you to be able to see what our business is like in terms of size, we're a team of 30 people now. We make of a little over 10 million in revenue. And as for the channels, we sell mainly on our own website. We sell also on marketplace such as Amazon. Uh, we are on wholesale. We have a little over 350 uh, independent retail stores. And uh, we have eight of our own uh, retail locations that are based in France. So therefore, I think I do respond to the multi-channel word, which is digital marketplace, wholesale and retail. Uh, what I'd like to do in the few minutes that I have with you guys is walk you through, or I'd say enlighten the different uh, treasures and traps that each of the channels hide because we say one is much better than the other. The truth is, well, they all have lots of pros and cons, and this is why as of today, we're on all channels. Uh, I'll start by um, talking to you about the wholesale because this is the first channel I have uh, sold my products through when I started my business. I was 23, fresh out of university, my uh, finance degree in my pocket, and I decided to help out a friend who had a candle brand. Um, we decided to sell only through wholesale at the beginning. Uh, to be very clear, wholesale is I sell uh, uh, candles in bulk to an independent retail store. They buy it for a cheaper price than the retail price. They make their markup, they pay the rent, they pay their own employee, and then they sell the product. So this is wholesale. And we decided to start with this channel for three reasons. First one, there's no background needed. It's very easy. The simplest work, you pick up the phone, call the owner, and hopefully you make an invoice. That's easy. Second reason was it was the fastest way to get revenue. Because in this situation, you make invoices for multiple candles at a time. It's not one by one. Hopefully, if you sell the first invoice, you're going to put 20 candles, 30 candles. So it's the fastest way to get revenue. And then third one, which would be the last, is this, there's no marketing dollars needed or very little when you begin. You just pick up the phone, send a picture of the product through email, and then hopefully the product is good enough that the owner of the store is going to give it a try and place the first order. So that's how we started this business. Um, we had around over 200 retailers, but after three years, I realized I hated this channel and I pivoted the business into a B2B private label business that I will maybe talk about later. 
Now, the reason why I hated it and why I just uh, uh, abandoned this channel for this channel for about five years, and now I'm back to it. The, the, the first reason would be the margin, because you have your own brand, you have your product, and the retailer is taking the biggest chunk of the uh, of the margin. Not that it doesn't, um, it's it's not needed because he has he pays the rent and then he pays his employees and then he needs to make a living. That I understand, but for you to to understand really clearly, a scented candle, maybe you'd pay for it 30 euros. That's already quite expensive for a candle. Now a candle at 30 euros, the independent retail store is gonna ask to pay for it 10 euros. He needs a three markup. But at 10 euros, the thing is, my candle is costing me six euros to make. Therefore, I'm making 40% margin. Let me tell you, you cannot operate a wholesale business with 40% margin. Therefore, I only have two options. Whether I price the product at 40 or 50 euros, but then I'm not competitive to anyone anymore, whether I just accept to have such a low margin, that's very challenging. Now, for you to be able to understand a successful business in the wholesale industry needs a 10 multiple, meaning a, a, a fragrance that would you would pay 50, 50 euros for needs to be produced for five euros tops. So this is how this channel works. You need very high margins to be able to operate. Now, the other problems that I faced, there are many, I will just cite three, is that you just cannot storytell your brand. I'm fully dependent on the store to tell my brand what I do, where the fragrance come from, is the wax natural or not? And let me tell, let me keep you the suspense, they just don't do it. Therefore, you just can't storytell your brand. Now, the third problem is that if you want to grow your business and you want to have more and more retail stores, at some point, the phone is not, is not, just doesn't do it anymore. Therefore, you have to go to trade shows. Trade shows are super expensive. If you want to exist at a trade show, you cannot pay the minimum 6,000 or 7,000 euros boost. You have to go for the bigger boost, which means 10,000, 20,000, and then you need to hire someone to make the phone calls. At the end of the day, you make very little margins. You don't really can store, you can't store retail the brand, and it's very hard to grow. So for these reasons, I decided to leave this part of the, the business, and I uh, decided to pivot the business and go to B2B. Well, a few years after that, I, I make a little move uh, in the future, and I started my own brand of candle, which is my jolly candle, the one I have today, and I decided to sell it through our own website to respond to these other problems. Why my own website? I can tell my brand myself. I have I can tell as many things as I want to, as many people as I want, the way I want to. I can tell my brand. This is the big advantage here. Also, you can be competitive to other brands. Why? Because there's no middleman. If there is no middleman, then I can price it as low as I want and keep the full margin for myself. It seems great, so we did it. But there are also major problems here. First, building a good website is expensive. We sell candles, not rockets. Our website costs us 200,000 euros. This is the, the type of website you need to be able to scale a business. So for sure, we make a few millions online, but we're not making hundreds of millions. It's a lot of money. So the, the second thing is marketing online is very, very complicated to operate. It's not like you would just make an ad, put it on Facebook and it would work. Now, the advertising online is brutal. Like people are more technical one than the other. It's changing every day. It's tough to just operate marketing online. No. Also, if you want to emerge, lots of marketing dollars are needed. That's the third problem. Fourth problem that comes afterwards is handling the logistics. It's tough. We're sending over 300,000 candles a year. Let me tell you, we're not doing this on our own. So we need to partner up with logistics. You need to deal with lots of contracts, lots of problems. Well, it's you need full-time employee just to handle the logistics. It's a big thing. And also, last but not least, you're fully dependent on Facebook and Instagram. That's just the game. At the end of the day, if I want to get new customers, I have to pay money to Instagram and Facebook. The thing is, how much they're going to charge me to get a new customer? They decide. So over the years, I've just seen the cost of acquiring a customer just increase and increase and increase. I can't do anything. That's just how competition is. So I don't complain. I just go to another channel.
And that's how we decided to move to the marketplaces in Amazon. So we went on Amazon and then the first day we went to Amazon, we did 10% increase in revenue. And ever since we've been there, Amazon is about 10% of our revenue. So Amazon to me, or the marketplace model, I'm talking about Amazon because this is the biggest one and this is where the only one we decided to go to. Well, going to Amazon is great because there's no costly website to set up. It's just, I think you pay 30 euros a month or something. You don't have to be really technical. There's no background needed. Very, very few marketing dollars needed. And you, don't, you do not have to deal with the logistics. If I can sum it up, it's a variable cost only game. And this is great when you have a business because you don't want to take too much risk. With Amazon, I give them money only when I make money. This is what I like about this channel. You don't have to invest so much. Now, the problem is if you don't take risk, you can grow a lot. So I know Amazon is not going to double my business, but that's fair enough for me. I make 10% more. I don't take risk. I hire nobody and I get to respond to a need. Now, the, make the bigger difference in between my own website, in, on my own website, I run ads on Facebook. I create the need. Now, on Amazon, I respond to a need. There's someone out there that's typing candle. They need a candle. I'm here for them. So this is a different ball game. This is very different. Now, the challenge is also, you can very hardly tell your brand on Amazon because you only have one page against your full website where you can tell everything you want everywhere. You can't complain about this because you don't take risk and you don't pay much. I mean, you have what you pay for. So at the end, we still had to grow. And this is my final part. I have two more minutes. Uh, we decided to open our own store. Now, as of today, we have eight retail locations of our own. And what I like about our stores is that our customers can finally smell our candles. This may seem weird, but they actually can smell and see the product, which is great. We can really tell our brands. We can design the store as we want to. This is great also. We can keep the, the, the retail prices competitive, well, in a physical world, because there's no middlemen. And I can just recruit new customers that are walking by the street, which is great. But this channel has its own problems also because it's a lot of cash to open a store. Just one, one store location for us is about 250,000 euros. It's a lot of money to sell candles, but that's what it costs to make a good environment, a good store in a good environment. That's what we realized. Also, it's a fixed cost model only, which means you have to take a lot of risk. Now, we talked about COVID earlier. Let me tell you, I learned it the hard way. You have to pay the rent, you have to pay the people and the money is not flowing in. This is very different from a marketplace model where money doesn't come, you don't have to pay. Why retail is very different. And the last problem you have with retail is it needs a lot of people to operate because it's, it's, a people, it's a people's job. So this is all I had to say about all the different channels. My conclusion would be that to me, the only way I would say to balance out the cons and the problems you can have with a channel is just to open another channel. And when you open another channel, you open the pros with it. So when COVID strikes, wholesale and retail suffer a lot, but online is growing a lot. But when online growth is suffering, I just open a new marketplace. So this is the way I see it. They have to go together to be able to, to grow the business. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this was now a great presentation because it shows really how you as an entrepreneur are thinking and, and handle these problems in a very practical way. It's about cost. It's about what was coming in and how you use these channels. This was very great. I think this is why how it explains how you act and other SMEs act. It, it shows also that, uh, that uh, you are reacting on customers' needs and then also how you build up a business. I think we had some data that in the future after COVID, we will have more entrepreneurs like you who start in digital and then going analog, then from analog to digital. And I think what is what is uh, what you say with Amazon or eBay uh, or others uh, there, uh, we had this uh, phenomenon in, during the COVID crisis that it was growing very fast because if you don't have a, ve a website by your own, like you who invested and you have worked on this, uh, 
how you can build up so fast a, a, a selling channel without costs and this is then only with the big ones possible so um i think this is a very good good point but we're coming now to the debate to uh, Andra, andreas Haderlein. i think you're going the way in the other side you're going how to bring uh, analog shops in, in the majority and city centers digital and you have also this approach to work also how to, to, to activate the region, how to, 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 to make it regional. I think it's, it's another approach then to rising out from, 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 from the digital world, then to say I'm starting from, from my home, from, from my home region, and then to reach my traditional uh, customers. Please, the floor is yours. So, uh, first of all, I have to choose my presentation. I hope that you all see the, the main screen, not my moderator screen. Is, it, is this the case? Yes, okay. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation and to bring in discussion my point of view uh, on this uh, issue, digitization of uh, inner cities and uh, especially owner operated retail. Um, I have chosen a, a, a title, uh, it's called Local Commerce as Learning by Doing. That's the way I see it. And local, I come to the, to the definition uh, of local commerce in the next few uh, slides. But first of all, let me give you some, an, a quotation of, uh, that I found 10 years or six, six, seven years ago. And this quotation goes like this. For many businesses, the question is not whether to trade online, it's how to start. So what this means, digitization is painful. It eats time and financial resources. And the question is not whether to invest in digital systems and online concepts, but when and how. Uh, this applies um, by far more uh, to all the inner city traders, especially the, the owner managed businesses. And the key problem is we have no shortage of technology. We have Amazon, we have eBay, we have online shops, multi vendor online shops, and so on. However, we have a crucial lack of change managers in the cities. That's the point. So, local commerce projects, if they are concepted as moderation processes, are able to fill the gap between technology on the one hand and mostly very little knowledge of how to handle that technology on the other hand and to come straight to the point we need uh, to better focus on an old educational concept and that is called learning by doing um, this is my definition of local commerce so it's not very difficult e-commerce plus stationary retail is local commerce and uh, to avoid misunderstandings, um, in my understanding, local commerce is a new category of e-commerce where the best issues of two different worlds meet offline and online. Um, when we have a look at the ecosystems of uh, local commerce infrastructures, um, we see the change that has brought uh, the pandemic. Um, after almost 10 years of existence of uh, local online marketplaces, they are now integrating different digital tools for customer loyalty. Last but not least, driven by COVID-19, and uh, it all started with simple online storefronts without e-commerce functionalities, without checkout and so on. Then we had uh, the multi-vendor online shops with uh, e-commerce functionalities. Then um, there were integrated city vouchers and with the pandemic, uh, local commerce infrastructures were also uh, uh, implemented to have an infrastructure for emergency supply and also for solidarity vouchers in the pandemic. And the next figure is, is one of my main figures in my book, local commerce. Um, it says how the way goes uh, towards uh, digitally, um, competent uh, a trader and, and city. So first of all, we have individual actions. And secondly, there are cooperative actions. And uh, we can focus on 
contact addresses and so on, and we can focus on product data. So on the, on the left hand, we have all the individual actions that also Samuel has told us about. Uh, he has his own online shop. He, he, he deals on the marketplace, maybe also on the specific marketplace, like sugar, like uh, in, in, the, in the candle businesses or in the candle business. Uh, but um, the homework of the trader is to be present in Google, to have a profile on social media platforms, to have a, a, a nice homepage and so on. And then it goes to the cooperative actions. And this is my, my core theme, so to say. This is my core field in which um, I work. So local regional marketplaces, the sh shop, functional uh, shop functionalities are um, the very core of local commerce concepts. Um, I um, like to, to talk about umbrella marketing based on digital city initiatives. And there are several actors in this field like uh, Atalanta or Online City Wuppertal that I uh, brought forward uh, seven years ago. But there are several infrastructure givers now uh, in Germany. But we also have actions taken by Amazon and eBay, eBay City, for example, or Amazon Storefronts. So, so the, the, the market is very lively now. And uh, what, what is important to, to, to understand is that the availability of product data is the main challenge of the three main challenges. So learning by doing and training is, is one thing and the will to cooperate the other thing, but to have the availability of product data is especially for the owner um, operated retail businesses, very, very difficult. And it's not, only the costs, it's the knowledge, it's legal issues and so on that have to be uh, considered in this, um, in this case. And I only have five minutes, so I have to, have to uh, end here with my presentation. But let me tell you, checking the availability of goods in local shops will soon feel as natural as picking up bread rolls on Sunday. And um, online presence, always causes offline foot, footfall, as also has said Neil Saunders today. So let us go into details now in the debate. I'm really looking forward to this discussion and uh, thanks again for the invitation to this panel. Thank you very much. You gave us really a, a very good, excellent overview uh, how how these uh, different categories and that it's in fact how this is uh, this, this regional concept is going over to, to also to, to larger channels and this is a model what, what will work in the future and also the projects we will discuss later like online Wuppertal I think there's there's a lot also to to to, to learn and to to, to 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 see and now we're going to uh, James Kalacher, Kalacher huh? I hope I say it in a nice way CTO Cybertil you are helping SMEs to build up shops like Mr. Gossas, uh, this uh, retail store platform, and also to use omni channels. Uh, which kind of SMEs are this? How you can help them with the costs? And do you see also such cities uh, initiatives are, would be your partner for, for your services? Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Horst. Um, very good to speak to everybody today. Thank you. And uh, firstly, uh, can I say i uh, hugely uh, uh, kind of glad to be here and be able to talk to you guys today uh, regarding uh, how technology can help you. But uh, it's great to hear about how people like yourself, Sam, are, are grabbing the opportunity to channel hop and identify for your business what is happening. And, and the great news from Neil is, is that the pandemic is not killing the high street. Or, or the inner city. In fact, if anything, is helping complement and drive it. And certainly as a vendor, what I wanted to do today was give you our perspective on that and how, how we're helping people, but also what we're seeing. Uh, uh, CyberTill, uh, uh, just very quickly, uh, is, a, is a 20 year old organization now. So we've been in retail for 20 years. We were probably one of the first organizations to pioneer what we might call cloud retail today, uh, uh, very different. It was 20 years ago, uh, just after the dot-com boom in 2000. But, but today, uh, it's very much about being uh, a retailer 
across channels. And, 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 and like everybody's talked about today, channels is actually a retailer and a kind of technology word. You know, when consumers talk to us, they, they, they don't think in channels. They think, uh, as, as, as your diagram showed earlier, Neil, they think in terms of the retail conversation. They search in one place, they identify and reference in another, and they therefore want to build that confidence in what they're buying. And then they buy it. The transaction is not the center. It's, it, it's one of the ends. So what I want to do is give you a little bit of view on that. We, we deal with the retailers in a number of areas. Uh, uh, let's, let's just pop my slide up for you so you can have a look at this today. So, so yes, so uh, we, we, uh, uh, we, we deal with a number of retailers out there at the moment, about 300 in the kind of general retail space and about 300 in the charity retail space. And they are dealing with the, the epic of the pandemic very differently uh, in different areas of, of their businesses. Um, you know, our, our, our current systems probably process in the regions of about 1.2 billion pounds worth of revenues each year with, with quite a significant transaction base. But they, like everybody around here, have noticed this journey change that, that Neil spoke about. People will no longer follow the standard build awareness, build trust, build engagement, build booking and conversion. They are now doing that all over the place. They're doing that in a unified commerce way which means that they're seeing all of the information and receiving that information from different mediums. And I think one of the things we need to talk about is, is how channels is a conversation for us, but, but actually sometimes it's the consumer who's, who's out there and they're really a single conversation that they're having. Uh, and we need to be able to use technology to help us in that. What we do know is that when we look at all these channels, it's generating data. And, uh, and one of the things that Andrea said is, is that if, if, you, if you can look into there at the moment, that data has been generated in a local side in terms of the uh, economies in, in the high street, but it's also, as Sam found, in terms of online marketplaces or websites, there's lots of data being generated. And capturing that data is the key to identifying ultimately how we can deal with consumers going forward and, and give them a better experience, a better shopping experience moving forward. And that's really what CyberTool aims to do. We, we take the data that's generated out of all of these areas in terms of marketplace, mobile points of sale, pop-ups, in-stores, phone orders, wherever these orders are coming from, uh, and, and, and create a centralized insight capability that allows you to understand, back to Andreas's point, where is my product? Where is my stock? Where are my people? What, who's buying in what way? What payment methodologies are they using? Because uh, that data is ultimately going to help you, uh, as Sam said earlier on, make the decisions on how that affects margin, how that affects your, your supply chain, how that affects those elements just now. And Cyber2 has built a number of systems that come together in, in the center that allows, the, allows our uh, customers to use that insight to drive that. And all of those channels uh, feed into that central insight model so that you can see that whichever channel you're operating in, then they can, they can facilitate and, and do that. Uh, and, you know, we had some sound bites earlier on, and, and I, I won't go through this because Neil did it very more eloquently than I, but we know there is change out there. We're seeing increased number of web customers. We have approximately 350 websites out there today, all traded exceptionally well during the pandemic period. More people shopping on apps, marketplaces, social, stream selling, somebody mentioned the other uh, earlier on as well. These are all new service opportunities, but they are not killing the high street. They are complementing it. This is change, as we know. And this change is ultimately generating that data. And that data, if we're reading it correctly, we can generate into product to help us support retailers. And that's really what we're trying to do as, as a model in CyberTool in the systems that we provide for, for our retailers. Really, uh, David Bowie, I think, said it best. Tomorrow belongs to those who can hear it coming. And, and, and the way you can listen to tomorrow and the message I wanted to try and get across there today is do what Sam's doing, do what Andreas is doing. Look at those different channels, operate in those channels, but capture that data, use that data to drive your systems. And whether it's a point of sale in a retail store or a marketplace feed or a website, that information is telling you things about your consumer that you would not normally get to know about them as, as if they just walked into a high street. And therefore, sometimes that information can be very beneficial to drive that, that content. And ultimately, if you can use that data, 
then then I believe that you'll be able to listen and respond appropriately and, and make those changes, hopefully ahead of that. Um, I, you know, I believe in what Neil said earlier on, that this is an acceleration. The pandemic has driven an acceleration here. I do not believe it to be the end of the high street. Uh, and, and I think ultimately, uh, you know, that, that channel experience that Sam mentioned is gathering that data and understanding how we operate in each of these areas. And we, you know, we as a, a, as a vendor are seeing that with a lot of our channels. From, from one store to, 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 to uh, locations that have over 700 stores today, they're, they're, they're looking to use that data to drive uh, you know, knowledge and how they trade in those environments. And I'm looking forward very much to the debate later, and then hopefully I can add a, a vendor view into that that might help. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you gave us a very brief and good uh, a visual overview how the the, the cons consumer today are interacting that he's not thinking no, uh, he's thinking another way he's in communication in fact he wants to communicate in these different channels and then is the like you say the transaction is at, at, the, at the end I think it's very important um, and I think we will discuss also then then more how to empower SMEs to do this because if you say it is very complicated to handle all these channels. You, uh, I think, to handle one channel, two channels, but if you are really interacting with all the different possibilities, I think we, we have to see how really SMEs, small, uh, small companies, can implement this in the daily business because it's also an investment of time, not only of money. So now we're coming to Alexis uh, Varavka, Head Digital Competitiveness Independent Retail Europe. And it's very interesting. Uh, you are presenting uh, the independent retailers in the food and non-food sectors. I think this is this is from from uh, Edeka to experts, uh, the, the different uh, companies. They are uh, in fact branded uh, together, so they have they are independently but branded. And what are the trends? What is your experience there? I, I think food we can already buy online. It's happened now. This was something I think what has come very forward now during the pandemic. But uh, how is your perspective on this uh, of your members? Please, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to talk about this very important topic. You briefly mentioned my organization. Independent Retail Europe. Uh, as you said, it brings together um, groups of independent retailers operating under a common brand. You mentioned a few of the groups uh, that are in our membership. We also have national associations representing uh, independent retailers. And our membership basically uh, represents around 380,000 independent SME retailers and providing close to 6.6 .6 million jobs in Europe. Um, one point I, I would like to clarify straight from the beginning that we are a membership which is mostly based on the cooperative model, uh, which was mentioned very briefly in some of the previous interventions, meaning that we are both representing in a balanced way semi independent retailers and their groups uh, to which they belong, and groups being run by independent retailers, specifically for the uh, to represent the sole interest of, of independent retailers. So I'm glad to I'm glad to discuss uh, today this crucial topic uh, for retailers all over Europe, uh, this transition from pure offline retail to omni-channel or hybrid retail. And in this new um, area, uh, and we have, it has been mentioned several times, competition is moving online. Uh, and that means that traditionally offline actors must now operate efficient online sales channels and sometimes several of them at the same time, which is quite complex. Because if they don't, they will just struggle in a market which is increasingly driven by big online players. And the ongoing, um, COVID-19 pandemic is clearly acting as a catalyst in this move towards on the channel. Uh, just to give you two, two quick figures that are very striking. Um, E-commerce grew in one year at the best uh, equivalent to five years of pre-pandemic growth. So in just one year, it's five years of growth for e-commerce that materialized. And if you take Germany, for instance, about half of e-commerce is now down through the uh, Amazon channel, whether it's the marketplace or the Amazon retail uh, channel. So it's a very rapid change. Uh, in this context, um, offline retailers who are not an efficient online sales channel when the, the crisis hit, they took a severe hit. That's very clear. 
that we see from the figures and from the, the, the multiple uh, uh, problems that we face. Uh, but those who already had a fully efficient, uh, fully operational online uh, sales channel, those ones, they grow strongly, very strongly, and sometimes even stronger, even more strongly than pure online players. So that clearly shows that uh, embracing digital transformation and embracing it very quickly is actually paying off for, for uh, offline retailers moving to the omnichannel experience. Uh, but uh, if we want the retailers to be able to operate uh, multiple channels, especially online, uh, we need policies that support this transformation. And there, I would like to mention two things before concluding my, my remarks is the first one that we have competition rules that are may maybe not flexible enough for these multi-channel uh, solutions. Competition rules were mostly designed about 10 years ago when we were at the very beginning of the move towards e-commerce and uh, they don't support very well omni-channel retail. Uh, for instance, they don't take very well into account the specific services provided in shops by retailers, uh, not allowing them to have uh, lower prices uh, than uh, pure, offline, uh, pure online retailers or not allowing to demonstrate that they have specificities to benefit from their selective distribution systems. We also have rules which prohibit or put some obstacle to data exchanges in, in cooperation between different retailers. And since data is the new goal, that is probably something problematic for the future. But we also have rules that are sometimes not allowing to have cooperative groups to have a simple and efficient uh, web shop. So there's a clear opportunity and a need to reform the competition law to make sure that the independent retailers can fully operate online. And one last word also about platform legislation. It's a very trendy topic in the EU CACOs right now. We have a number of uh, policy proposals on the table. And well, I think everybody can agree that we need rule to tackle unsafe products being sold uh, on platforms by non-EU sellers placed in, well, in China, India, or wherever. Uh, and that is the intention behind the Digital Services Act being discussed at the moment. At the same time, we must have legislation that do not create obstacles to cooperation between independent retailers when they want to put their acts together, cooperate, and set up simple, efficient web shops uh, with limited risk of having illegal activity or illegal products. And unfortunately, um, the Digital Services Act, uh, currently uh, discussed uh, in the institution, failed to make that distinction, probably because it tries to create a rule for third party platforms such as Amazon and apply it for every single kind of platform, which is certainly a mistake from, my point, from our point of view. So just to conclude, very simple, um, I mean, digital transformation is happening. It's happening very fast. I think all the people before me mentioned it and very, with very striking examples, but to stay relevant, stationary retailers have to embrace it soon. They should not be reluctant. They really have to, to, to act now. And they need to be helped by policymakers who have a duty to basically design a supportive legal environment. So I will stop here and I thank you very much for your, for your attention and I look forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Varavka, that you make the link to, to the ongoing legislation in, in Brussels. We will have with hosted by Mr. Saliba, former rapporteur of the DSA, and uh, Ms. Wilkunen, the new rapporteur for the second part of the DSA soon so we you can join it in and we can discuss it there but but I think what you say what is very important it must be easier to go online to use the multi-channel that we have to to change the competition law and uh, I think what you mentioned also that the regulation of DSA is hitting the small platforms and but we have to find something what is fits for everybody because I think if you have all exceptions and so on, this will be in the end also confusing all. So it must be practical and, and, and clear. So we coming now to the last uh, uh, speaker for the debate, um, Christoph Meinecke, mayor of a city of 14,000 citizens. Now you heard all these ideas about SMEs or about success of, 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 of an entrepreneur, then, then how the concepts are. And now you are there as a policy maker and they have your little city and your little, little city center. What you can take with you and what you can really say from your experience, what's, what's going on on your field, please, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Heitz. 
my name is Christoph Meinecke, I'm mayor of the city of Wenningsen, which is in the outskirts of Hanover in Lower Saxony in Germany. Hanover was quite famous as an industrial trade fair city, which is also a big issue in COVID-19 days. So we talk about retail, we talk about um, trade fairs and other things. What we see in the, in the cities is that, of course, COVID is a great challenge we are facing, but we also feel the desire of the people to get back into the cities. Man is a human animal, a, a, a social animal, and uh, people want to meet, people want to gather, they want to be around with each other, and we see that. Of course, we have a lot of vacancies at the moment, especially with the little corner stores, with the privately owned retail, with the owner-operated retail stores. But there's also the demand to, to reinvent the inner cities, to reinvent the high, the high street, the main street. Um, and we are just trying to find ways to get the demand um, back into the cities and the want and the need to gather. Um, for example, here in Wenningsen, we have a very traditional grocery store in the fifth generation. And one of the senior owners always used to say in German, um, wo man sich drängt, da geht man wieder hin. Where you crowd, there you come back. And this is what we have to do in the large cities, in the small cities, to make attractive places of trade, but also of local identification and of culture. What makes the cities in Europe so interesting is, um, which is quite a difference, for example, to the American cities, is the high density, is to have many places of interest in a very close place. You can have places of spirituality, a church right next to a larger retail store, places where families meet, kindergartens, um, right next to, to schools and other places of local infrastructure. Um, this infrastructure is quite eroding, but we see that the, the COVID crisis is quite an, an accelerator um, to, to foster and to promote the drive back to the city. Uh, for example, in the assembly of cities here in Lower Saxony, um, we were issuing a position paper in February this year with eight key findings, um, which are very important to us. The one thing we see is that the former forms of competition between the high street and, um, as, as we say, the green, the green meadow, uh, the non-integrated locations in, in trade. This kind of competition is not as harsh as it was the, the years before, because the non-integrated locations in the, in the outskirts of the city, um, they are challenged much more by Amazon, for example, and other online stores than the small local stores we have. What is quite interesting that we have in the city um, not new forms of competition, but quite harsh forms of competitions which were growing in the in the recent years. For example, we have one very good and very, very important small warehouse where you can buy virtually everything. The, the children can buy sweets, the uh, families can buy household goods and toys and everything. Um, well, of course, one of the main competitors is, is Amazon and, and online stores, but we see that especially uh, the larger groups like Rossmann, for example, they are now selling toys, which is one of the, the great, margin, um, great margin goods, which are fostering now and um, making larger scale competition to these um, structures, which have been growing in the recent years. So we have to try to get, to get back small scaled businesses and make it attractive. One thing we do is of course, um, to get rid of some regulations. We in the city are just one part. Brussels is much more important to us than for example, Hanover or, or Berlin. 
Um, today, a good assortment of goods, for example, in a bookstore, today you have to you have also to sell your cup of coffee. You have to have a place where you can meet, where you can look around, where you where you can just scroll through the books. And this is quite hard in these days of regulation. Because you need more parking lots, you need to ask, um, for example, the regulators when you sell food and, and other things. So what we need is, is uh, much less regulation within the city to get small, to give small retailers and small shops a better chance. Um, also, we see that in the cities, um, we need to make new policies, especially in, in the case of property. We have also in smaller and, and, and larger cities property grabbing, which is the big funds are trying to, to transform a good shopping locations, for example, um, into living space. Um, we are trying to get better funding programs um, to, to get higher acceptance in the community um, for the local retail stores. We really hope that COVID gives us um, some sort of immediate chances to get these immediate programs into the city. And the innovation for, for this kind of retail stores, of course, comes on the one hand from the owners who really want to, when we hear, when we meet our our um, assembly of, of of commercemen, for example, they're just they're full of ideas. Um, they are full of good good actions, good programs. But we need to bring this together with um, with regulation, with property owners, food inspection inspection, commercial inspection questions of, of, for example, building right, construction rights. So this is one of the main topics we are facing here at, at the basis of local um, commerce. Um, when we were launching this program, we, we had quite open, open ears in, in the policy of Berlin, of, of, our, our, um, uh, of Hanover. Um, but what, what we really need to get is, is the, the place of excitement back to the city. Um, if for example, we have, we, have, we have great examples of, of cities here around to make their cities, uh, as I would say, Instagrammable, to, to have good food, food walks around, have beautiful places for photography, and um, to share the experience online, which is quite an important factor to get especially younger people back to the city. Um, so we have the two poles, I think, individualization of the customers and our especially work in the city assembly to get the social part um, back to the city. This is my quite short statement, Mr. Heitz, but the rest we can just discuss. Thank you very much. I think this was a very, very good and useful perspective. I think what you said is, is also clear that there is also other competition what, what is coming to the inner cities like Rossmann, like Heinz, big players who are pushing also small companies, uh, sell retailers away. Um, so we have not to say in the, in the past, it was yeah, not the e-commerce platforms or uh, marketplaces, it was big shopping malls who were, were built outside and everybody went there and then the, the, the little city centers were empty. Um, I want only to say there's so much, a lot of very good impact, uh, idea, uh, ideas and, and information from your side. I want to start with Mr. Haberlein. What we can do, um, I, I see sometimes that we spoke, Mr. Kalakal says this, Mr. Gas, that we have to communicate with the consumer, with the, with the customers. But if I'm going to city centers, if I want to have to I get always everywhere the same communication, the same big shops, the same, same uh, experience, there is this really, then McDonald's is there, and then you have to say, why there is there is not this 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 uh, this um, life moment? Then I'm going to I can do this exactly without stress online. Why I should do the go to the inner city stand? And uh, 
the, perhaps it's also better because if you see now that, that also the, the 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 policy to not to enter with a car anymore in the city center i say i'm ordering online it's easier but is your answer for this yes. um thank you very much um first of all i think it was james who said the pandemic has not killed high streets that's true that's very true. Uh, the killing of the high streets started already 50 to 60 years ago with introducing the pedestrian area. And the pedestrian area made the city just the same as you see it everywhere. No? And uh, Christoph uh, addressed the fact that um, the medium or small sized shops uh, and owner managed shops. Uh, weren't uh, we're not uh, in the in the, the difficulties as uh, are the uh, the big retail boxes in on the grüne wiese as we say in german that's true also and i think the inner city will become more diverse smaller and ideally also an important social and not only economic space for interaction so i think these are the um, this is the learning uh, of the pandemic, but uh, as we all know, it's mere market. So what happens to the owner of the retail spaces? What happens uh, to the whole uh, um, uh, um, to, to the sector of uh, of uh, I and the air and co? So uh, the, the the big um, assemblies and the big joint ventures of um, Sport 2000, Intersport, uh, as we all, uh, they, they are part of the old inner city, but are they really part of the new city? That's, that's the, the core question. Um, and the customer will say, yes, I need Sport 2000, I need Galleria Kaufhof, I need H&M, uh, I need um, all the big boxes. But uh, can they afford to be in the inner city in the next years as they as it happened the last years? Yeah? Because retail was really simple uh, in the last years. If you have uh, enough money, you can open a shop and you have the um, uh, sovereignty over, over purchasing things. But uh, latest since, since Amazon entered the stage, this time is, has passed and now we we have to reassembly the whole inner city um architecture the whole city um uh, inner city network so to say and the customer itself or the customer himself will decide in the end uh, where to buy things i think normal assortment you we will buy it on the internet, but uh, special assortments and also assortment that is driven by service, we still we will still have um, in the inner city. So and we will all also have the renaissance of a uh, renaissance of craftsmen's yards or innovation centers in the inner city. So I think there there will happen a lot of things uh, that we cannot imagine yet. But COVID has shown up. Uh, where where the path goes thank you this sounds not so scary if, if the handman's craft is coming back but uh, mr gas uh, if you would say explain where is your competition is the competition for you in the internet or is you, you find him in the inner cities or with the big companies if you want to to say where is your or is it there is no competition it's only the, the, to gain the customer how you, if you spoke before for unfair competition and so on, how you think, how you would explain or describe it? What is your feeling of, of the competition at the moment? Is this fair? And where is really the key, the key points of the competition for you? Please, the floor is yours. I, I, I think I heard my name. Was the question for me? Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, well, well, the competition, I mean, Every channel has its own competition. There are competitors I don't care about at all on a certain channel. I mean, all the people I compete with on Amazon are not the, compete, the, the people I compete with at all on retail. 
Um, my competition on wholesale can just be a, a, a reusable water bottle because someone comes into the store and they have a gift to make. Who's my competition here? Even if I'm the only candle brand, it's going to be the product next to me. So it's really hard to respond very sim in a simplistic way to your question because all my competition depends on the channel I'm sold on. And I'm going to fight in a very different way depending on the channel I'm on. Thank you very much. I, I think this is, this is also good impact. But if I'm going to Mr. Gallagher back, if an SME is coming to you, they're coming already with five channels or with starting with one channel? What is the normal SME who is coming and says, I want to engage in this high level? Or you say, normally, these clients you get, they are already, I would say, elevated. And normally, we have only this micro business who is starting with, with Amazon, eBay, or with his own website, please. Yeah, I, w I wish there was a normal, uh, to be fair uh, on this one, uh, Horst. I, I think what we're, what we're finding just now is a lot of clients in the UK have started in the physical and are moving to digital. So they're moving online, they're moving into web, they're moving into social, they're moving into marketplace. But actually a lot of our newer customers, uh, people people like Samuel, uh, you know, are, are saying, well, actually, you know, maybe retail setup, you mentioned a quarter of, you know, a, a million uh you know, dollars to set up a store, you know, that's a, that's a large investment. So let me try my products on a marketplace in a, you know, in, in, in a social media whereby I can start to determine what we can do from that. So we're, we're seeing both. We're seeing both those clients come up through there at the moment. And we have clients from one store and one website through to 700 stores. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking to one just now with 2000 stores. And uh, I, I think for them, there's very different dynamics, as, as Sam said. I think the dynamics online are very different from the larger retailers and small retailers. But online is also a leveler. You know, you can be, uh, you know, a, a one or two man organization and, and sell cross country, cross brand, cross, cross channel uh, many, many times and be very successful in doing that because your product is unique and it's, it's, it's grown from the passion that you have as a retailer and an entrepreneur to be able to do that. And we, we, we find that people are, are taking different paths. What I would say is don't ignore online, don't ignore marketplace at the moment, and certainly don't ignore social selling because a lot of our customers, our new customers are in that space. You know, we talk about product placement nowadays. The, the teenagers of today are not going to your website. They're in Facebook and they're on marketplaces. That's where you, so put your product where they are. That's kind of one of our pieces of advice. And therefore, uh, use that also to drive store traffic. Um, we, we're working with a company just now who's um, uh, um, you know, taking the, the, the stock data from a store and publishing it on Google. So when you're searching for a pair of brown brogues or shoes or something, it says, go to the store. It's only five minutes along the road from you. So it's driving back to Christoph's uh, you know, city center. It's driving people to him and to, to his stores yeah, the, this is coming from Google and it's coming from online. So it, it, it's, it's that kind of used, used both mediums to drive in-store footfall, but also to give, you know, like Sam, the, the, the multi-channel opportunity. Uh, sorry, it's not, it's not an exact answer, but I, I do believe every business is very different. Thank you very much. I think it was a very good answer. I think what you also mentioned was a good point. We went back from, from, from the high scale selling to regional. But what you say is from regional reach out. And I think this is, yeah, if you have a weak region with, with unemployment and, and where the customer is not, it is also a chance for such cities to go digital, to sell in different ways. If, if you have no clients, then you have to move your shop to go into another region or you bring it digital to the clients. Um, I want to go to Mr. Varadkar with his business models of his members. What is your answer in two points? One, if it's going to smaller, more individual shops, you are, in fact, in selling your brands together. Huh? This is, uh, in fact, one part. And second part is uh, social selling. I think uh, we say that from my, uh, my Julie Kendall, this is a very strong social selling. I think there's, there's uh, not only with pictures, also with perhaps with blogs. Uh, what, where is your part? Is how are your members would reacting? Because this would be also a change for the, for the fundamental business model, perhaps also, or adaption, I think, adaption. Huh? Please, the floor is Thank you very much. Uh, 
Well, it's difficult to, to give you a one size fits all answer uh, because um, as I mentioned at the very beginning of my introduction, we have members in the food and non-food sector. So we have grocery, on, online groceries, uh, offline grocery. We have also sports retailer, electronic goods, uh, etc. So it's very difficult to, to, to give you one uh, simple answer that would be valid for everybody. Uh, one thing is, which is however clear, uh, whatever the types of retailers, that you have some common consumer trends that's going to affect uh, independent retailers. Uh, it is also so very, very important in, in an online context. Uh, you have the digital transformation, but you have also the sustainability transformation. Uh, consumers are more and more trying to shop local. They are interested in the, the local added value of products and shops. They are looking for an individualized uh, customer relation. And that is something that you cannot have with only one single big store located 30 kilometers away. So uh, there is a lot of added value and potential for uh, for small retail shops in the inner city uh, that and they can bring this added value in terms of sustainability, individualized customer experience, and this local feeling, local touch uh, very clearly, uh, I think. And that is uh, to be linked with, uh, with the digital transformation because, I mean, it's very good to let your actual customer uh, know about that, but you need to reach out to these new customers who are on these new uh, online sales channels, which who are on the marketplace, which are online on social media. Uh, this is where uh, the two channels are complementary, not only to uh, make sure that your current customers stay loyal to your shops, but also to acquire new customers by letting them know that you are bringing these benefits this, uh, this local experience, this local shop experience, this uh, uh, seamless and individualized customer experience. And this is where the two channels are completely complementary. Thank you very much. And now we're coming to, to the closing of, of the debate. Mr. Sanders, after you heard all our, our speakers now, uh, what, we, what is your reflection uh, according to your study to this? What would be your comment ab about this? Was something of surprising or underlining this experience what you made with, with your study? Please, floor is yours. Um, yes, I, I think uh, all of the contributions have been very, very interesting um, this morning. And I think they all, to some extent, um, underline what we found in the study from consumers and the retailers that we spoke to, that um, this isn't uh, a battle between online and stores, as is so often thought. This is actually a very big opportunity for retailers and for commerce as a whole uh, to do well by connecting with customers in a variety of ways. Um, and I think that um, that is a very positive thing um, as we come out of the pandemic. Um, the challenge is not that people aren't buying and it's not that people don't want to go to physical spaces and it's not that towns are not relevant. Um, I don't think we've heard anything of that this morning. The challenge is just understanding how these uh, things need to evolve, the efforts we need to put into uh, reaching customers, meeting their needs. Um, and as we all know, things in the world move very fast. And I think everyone has reflected how uh, much faster they've moved now because of COVID. So we're all uh, running to catch up. Um, but um, there's a very big opportunity there. And I, I think we've heard a lot of positivity from everyone uh, today with very interesting examples. And I think that we uh, have a very bright future for retail if we can understand what the customer wants and make sure we put that in our policy and our practices in, in business. So uh, yeah, I mean, thank you to everyone. I've learned a lot this morning and I, I think it really underlines everything that we found in the study about uh, multi-channel. Uh, it's very exciting, very complicated, but uh, very, very positive for the future. Thank you very much. I think now I'm coming to the uh, closing uh, conclusion because Mr. Uh, Saliba had to go urgent to his committee. It was not so planned, but uh, I have to say, I think what we le I learned now, uh, the message is clear from you. It's not black and white. It is not so bad. It can be bright. It's depending what we are doing out of this. I see also that, that, that simple answers are not the best answers here. Because if we learned also from our SME today here, uh, Amazon or big players are not 
the, the bad competition is this one tool you can use and, uh, and you can use different tools and you have to see it more than tools, like tools, but you have to make the fair ground for all these tools that they are working the same basics. I think this is, this is the, the thing and I have the tendency not to over-regulate something, so to deregulate other tools so that we have to empower competition and competition is always good for the consumers. It is good for, 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 the, for the companies and especially for the SMEs because in competition, you should not underestimate SMEs. We have saw it with Mr. Samuel Gus. If you want, you can do it, but we have to bring, and this is, I think, the, the, the part of the politics and the part of Mr. Meinig and Mr. Saliba, how to motivate to bring these people on board, how to create this environment that they can use this, this, uh, this new, uh, new environment for their advantage. And I think in the end, we will have more colorful city centers again, not, not dead city centers. And perhaps it is much more uh, back to the roots, to old city centers, where it's more lively and a mix of different things than only to have monoliths who are all the same. Thank you very much. I think the discussion is not the end. I have to say it was very interesting. Have a nice day and stay healthy and successful. <laughs>